Hey, today's video is about NextFaster. NextFaster is a highly performant e-commerce template using Next.js and AI generated content. So the Next team recently put this out here. You can see it. It's a clone of McMastercar. If you're familiar with this website, this is what McMastercar looks like. It looks sort of like oldish, but apparently it's a highly loved website. And you can see it's a similar style and a lot of people use it. It's a big company. Anyway, so this is what it looks like. And you can see everything I'm doing is just incredibly fast. It just happens automatically. Every image just comes up immediately. If I do add to cart, like just everything's happening immediately. So I'm going to, in this video, I'm going to dive into the code behind the project. If you're new to this channel, it's called learn from open source. I try to dive into the code behind different open source projects. So today we're looking at next faster and see what we can learn from it to make our own websites faster. So tech stack, we're using Next.js 15. It only came out a few days ago. So most of you are gonna be on Next.js 14 or prior. We're using server actions, which came out with, uh, I guess, the next 13.4. We're using partial pre-rendering to make parts of this page static and parts of it dynamic. Drizzle RM is for the database RM, and then we're using Neon Postgres, which is really nice. And they're using Vercel Blob for the images. So basically Vercel's version of S3. And then they generated some of the UI with V0. They use GPT-40 mini to uh, generate product descriptions and categories and so on. That's not critical for us. And they use getImage.ai for creating the images with stable diffusion. So let's give that a quick look. Yeah, I to create and edit images with text. But yeah, what you can imagine, type in some text and get an image. So, okay, that's cool. And here's the page speed report. It got 100 across every category. Although I guess if I go here, I see it's 96. But anyway, it's close enough. We'll take a look at mobile. So mobile performance, interestingly enough, is still only 71, despite uh, this being like super performant. And because total blocking time is 1.7 seconds, but they didn't want to mention that on the homepage. So there's a Twitter thread here. I didn't notice this before, but let's just quickly go through it. So this is an open source e-commerce project built with Next.js, similar to Mastercard, and he's got 1 million products. So I didn't actually know that when I was looking at the demo. And so that's really, really impressive that everything that the incredible speed we're seeing is happening with a million product database. So this is a big question. How is it so fast? It uses many of the same optimizations your original site does, but where the McMastercard devs hand wrote these with jQuery and XJS automates a lot of this for you with strong defaults. The site heavily uses partial pre-rendering where the static shell of the dynamic page is pre-rendered at build time and served immediately on request with the dynamic parts streamed in. Our site also avoids loading spinners entirely, something the original actually has quite a lot of. So I just noticed you can actually click on this and then you get it in a normal mode. Images are everything for sites like this. We spent a ton of time on image optimization, mostly around loading strategies. In order to push the limits, we don't just prefetch HTML content, but we also prefetch the images of pages. Check out this side-by-side -side demo to see what a difference prefetching makes in reducing flashing. So we actually saw this optimization when playing around the site. You can see images load immediately, whereas in the previous version, it actually took a second, that flash. So how did they make that work? We're going to see this in the code. This is one of the main parts of the video, but we made things feel even faster by triggering links on mouse down as opposed to the default on mouse up. So now we've had an overview of the project. Let's dive into the code. You can see it's using PMPM. I'm going to quickly look in the package JSON. It's using ShadCN for components and so on. Here we'll see some of the packages we're using, a lot of ShadCN stuff. We're using this effect library. I'm not going to cover it, but yeah, those that like functional programming, you can take a look. We're using a lot of different uh, packages related to their cells. We're using Blob and KV for the Redis and uh, Postgres. That's basically the Neon database. We're using Upstash Redis and rate limiting. So the cell Redis or KV is, uh, it's Upstash behind the scenes. We can use them for rate limiting. And yeah, a whole bunch of other stuff. We're using uh, the ORM we mentioned is Drizzle. We're using link DOM, which we'll see in a bit. This is to pass the HTML of a page. And then other classic libraries, AI for the AI. That's also a Vercel package so for a passing, schema passing, and so on. And we are using Next.js 15. The latest version is 15.0.2. So you don't need to be on uh, this anymore, this version, because it's now been released. So here you can see the source folder. We'll take a look at that. But there are a few scripts. This is basically used to generate all the images and the descriptions and so on. And you can take a look in here. I'm not going to cover this, but here you see the effect library. There are lots of yield and generator statements in here. And this is how we spin to the database and so on. But the app itself, you will see that we're using app router. Overall, we, we here we have the overall layout of the website. So we'll take a look at this to give an idea that we've got a sidebar, top bar, and it's this middle content that goes and changes. 
So let's take a look at that here. We've just got lots of CSS to handle all of that. We've got next, next faster at the top, search drop down component. We have a bit of suspense going on. So I'll take a look at one of these. So here we have an auth server. So that's uh, related to login. So let's just keep that up there. And here you can see we're basically fetching the user on the server. So that's why it's in a suspense. This is server ended. And then these components, if there's a user, will show sign in, sign up. Otherwise, we'll show sign out. And here you can see this is just a client component. So it's auth.client.tsx with use client at the top. And you'll see that in the page. If I refresh the page, you'll see it's top right over here is where that shows up. So I'll quickly show you what uh, login looks like. I've already signed up. But yeah, here I have my account. Let's just refresh the page. And yeah, it's all automatically loaded instantly. It's funny, we have this fallback, but I didn't even see it being used at all because it was so fast, it just instantly shows. Here you can see a bit more with the cart is also uh, server rendered. If we take a look at that, this is get cart and it just shows it. And here, what are we doing? We are using the cookies and getting the cart from that. Okay, so continuing down here, we have order history links and here's basically the base page. And then we, we've got, I guess, a footer and some other pieces of the page as well. And Toast just set up and analytics at the bottom. So the site itself, you won't notice a page.tsx here for the homepage because you will find that over here in this category sidebar group. This group is basically everything with this layout, well, with the sidebar, I guess, choose category. It has it down the left over here. Before what we saw was just the, the top bar and the bottom bar in that layout. The sidebar is brought in on this layout. So that means you don't need to, the reason it's done this way in this group is so that only certain pages, well, most of the app has this sidebar, but if you go to like a sign in, sign up page, it, they won't want to show the sidebar. So they don't need it for that. Over here, you'll see a different group, which is actions. This actually, I don't think it should be here. I think maybe in the past they had a login screen, which is why this uh, group was here, but there's no page actually here. So they could move this to somewhere else. They could move this to the lib folder, which they probably should. And then we have some other pages here. We have like the order page and we have the order history page. If we take a look, if I go to order, you'll see, see it's the, the root layout now because we're not in this group over here's category sidebar. So that, that's now disappeared and it's the entire page. While we're on login actions, so we have this, uh, how this works is just uh, using Next.js actions. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically like calling an API, but you, you can just call it as a function. So behind the scenes, what this does is make a post request. Like you can just call this function sign up and it goes and does it, which is really nice. And they've also added this upper function, which is validated action. And basically you pass it in a schema and the actual action you want. And this is the action where they'll go and, you know, search the user in the database, check that the password is correct and so on, or create the user, make sure the user doesn't exist and so on. But they also want to validate the content that's coming in. So username and password. So instead of doing that at the top of every single action, what they've done is validated action. If we jump into that you'll see it's basically calling the action, which is the second parameter over here. And the first parameter is the schema. And here is where we do safe pass. So if there's an error, basically we won't call this and we'll just return an error to the client. We won't throw an error, we'll just return an error. This is the format. Otherwise we'll just go on to call our regular action. And now we have the type schema, which is available to us. So if I take a look here, username is a string, password is a string, which is based on this over here. And so Zord has validated this for us in runtime run as well. If you just do, uh, if you just put username, password, string, string, or TypeScript is saying it's a string, but you don't actually know the format of the data that's coming in. So that's why validate action with uh, or schema is used. If we take a look at the home page, so this is the page. Let's quickly jump back to it. So it's just a page sidebar and like lots of categories over here, quite a lot of categories. And here you can see we're just uh, yeah rendering this on the server. We are calling the database. This is get collections and get product count. And we're using unstable cache as well for that to speed things up even more. I really wish it wasn't called unstable cache anymore. So people would start to feel more comfortable using it. But uh, yeah, eventually we'll get there. And so here you can see we're just mapping through the categories and we're linking to every page. So yeah, this is actually extremely simple. We just have an image. We have a link to every category. Not much else happening there, but this link is doing a lot of work. So let's take a look at what's happening in link. And you'll notice this is links from components UI link. So this is the link we've created ourselves. And if we just take a look at this file quickly, you will see we are importing next link from next link. So that's actually what we're going to return in the end, but we're adjusting a whole bunch of things beforehand. So we're setting prefetch to false, although on the homepage, we actually set it to true. And then we are implementing it with on mouse enter and on mouse leave and on mouse down. We're doing all sorts of things. And this is really the most important part that on mouse enter, we are going to go and load up the next page. And we're going to find all the images on that page. And then we're going to load them in our browser. And that's how we got that super fast loading without the flash. Let me show you this, if that wasn't clear. So I'm going to open up my terminal. I'm going to close the, well, let's refresh the page. I'm just going to clear this for a second. 
And now, well, you can see every link I'm hovering on, like tons of images are just loading up. But for example, if I hover here, and you see we just got loads of images. And I'm going to clear that again and go back. This time it doesn't actually do it because it knows it's gone and done the images. But the reason it went and loaded all those images is because on the next page, we want all these images. And the second it does it is like when you put your mouse over a link, it won't like load a million images for you ahead of time, but it will when you hover over the link. And then it's got time to go and fetch the images. And now you can see they basically all loaded up by the time I've actually gone into the page and that one as well. So how does this work? First, we're doing router.prefetch. By the way, if you're using Nextlink, typically this would just happen automatically with like prefetch true, that's the default. It will automatically prefetch the next page. So it'll make it even faster to load. But what we want to do is it won't go and load the images on that page. So that's the extra optimization we've made here. So first, what is the href of this link? So we're prefetching it. Okay, that's like creating the regular functionality. Now, okay, there's a little bit more that happens before. So when the link goes onto the page, we have some images that we're setting. And in this use effect, you'll see the interaction observer. And basically what that is doing is trigger when at least 10% is visible. So it won't do this for everything on the page, but when at least 10% of the link is visible, then it will go and do this. And this stage is just fetching the URLs for the images on the next page. It's not loading the images yet, just the URLs. So let's do prefetch images and you will see we get into this function. By the way, yeah, this is still in UI link. We create the URL. And what we do is we call API prefetch images, and then we're going to return it and get the images we got. So let's take a look at this API prefetch images. Again, if we look at the structure of the app, then you'll see we have an API folder. We only have a few things here, but one of the routes is prefetch images and we can pass it other params in. So the path name, which could be like hello slash one slash two or whatever it is, or in our case product. And this is the function that actually runs pretty small file setting the host name, which will be different if we're in development or in production. We're using HTTPS in production. We're going to get await the params. This is the new Next.js 15, by the way. Typically, you wouldn't need await in Next.js 14 or prior. But now, if you want to get access to any params in an API route, you need to go and do await. So basically, we get the params, we're getting the href from it, and we're constructing the URL. So that's going to look like something like HTTPS our site .com slash like product one, two, three. And we're going to go and fetch it, a very simple fetch. And once we fetched it, we're going to get the text from the page. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pass the page. This uses parse HTML, which is from the link DOM library. This library, if you're not familiar with it, it's not a crawler. It's a triple link list based DOM like namespace for DOM list environments with the following goals. Avoid maximum core stack, guaranteed linear performance, be close to the current DOM standard, but not too close. Basically, we can call parse HTML on the page on something like this, and we're going to get the parse DOM back to us so we can interact with it. So we can do things like query select all to find all the forms on the page. And that's exactly what we do over here, parse HTML. You can see we've got the document, and in the document, we're going to do query select all main image. And this is going to get all the images, basically. Now we're going to map through all these images, and we're going to get attributes from them. So the attributes we're getting source set sizes and so on, and we're mapping them into this object. And then we're just going to filter out anything that doesn't have a source. And then we're going to return these images to the clients. So jumping back to prefetch images, this is back on the client. We got an image response. We returned it. These are the images. Let's see where we were with prefetch images. So we have these, we set them in set images. So we have the images set over here. And now we're going to go back to on mouse enter. And you can see we cycle through all these images and we're going to prefetch each of these images. So if we jump down to the bottom of the file, you will see they're creating this new image object and we are setting them up uh, all this data that we collected on the server about the next page we're going to jump to. So we have all of that. We set an onload uh, to be done or not. This basically tells us that it, if it's finished loading, then we're going to be done and well, it doesn't need to be removed from the scene set. A scene set, basically, we have a set of hrefs we've already loaded, so we don't need to load them again. So source set has been seen, just skip it, otherwise add it here. And uh, if we didn't finish loading it, we actually delete it. So if you see prefetch image, it basically returns a function which can go and remove it. And yeah, if done hasn't been set yet, it's going to go and remove it. So basically we went, we prefetched all the images, we got a remove back, we pushed the remove to the array. If we, on the on mouse leave, if we remove our mouse from it, we don't need these images anymore. If we haven't finished loading it, we're just gonna remove it from the array. And you can see on mouse down, we're basically doing router.push. So this is the, the link component. And what we've done basically is we fetched all the images from the server. 
that's just the hrefs the links for the images we want and then we went and prefetched all the images as well and then when we go on to the next page it's just super quick so that's your optimization around links and how you could use it yourself if you had like product page with like a thousand different products like this isn't super important for most sites but for image heavy sites like this yeah that could be really nice I think that's basically everything that's interesting about this project here. You can see some other pages, other layouts, uh, product pages, and so on. Uh, we saw the order history pages. So here you can see there's a static main page, basically. And then if you jump in here, you'll see there's a suspense. So there's this dynamic area, which is inside here. This is still server rendered, getting user on the server, but it uses suspense. But the main page doesn't need to wait on this get user to happen. And if they want, they could show some loading UI over here. If you want to read more about partial pre-rendering, so there's this blog post over here you could take a look at. The basic idea is you have certain static parts of the page and certain dynamic parts. So what we saw like here, this uh, the purple is static and like, these sections are dynamic. You'll see optimizations all over the place. So for example, in the search, we'll see response headers set, cache control. So basically, if we've searched for something, cache it for 10 minutes. So if this is called again, we don't need to get an, you know another fetch from the database. It will just return the same thing to make it faster in those cases. Other folders I didn't mention, so there's the DB. We're using Drizzle for the LRM. Here you can see the structure of the project. You could create tables like collections with ID name and slug and so on. Oh, one other thing I will mention. So you'll see pages like this where we have a page for a certain collection. So I think this might be a collection over here on the website. And then you can see we do generate static params. So what's, what that is doing is basically creating lots of static pages, one for every collection. So this is doing a fetch for all the different collections, basically. And we're going to get a slug back. So, so this is going to return a promise with collection string, uh, an array, basically. And then each sort of page is going to be loaded with a single collection as the string. Again, params is now a promise. So we do await on that collection. Now we have the collection name. And so all those pages have been statically created. And now sort of this is the content of each page. You can see get collection details where we basically want the slug to be equal to connection slug. And here you have the page, which basically maps to all the collections categories showing images of each one. In the lib folder, here you'll see different actions we have. So we have add to cart. These are server actions. Uh, you'll see use server at the top of the file. So we've got add to cart, remove from cart. Uh, we have the middleware we mentioned before, which is the validate action function. Um, we have actions that actually go and update the cart. So this is stored in cookies, or we get the cart from cookies. Here we have rate limiting. This uses up to dash rate limit. Basically make sure that let's say someone isn't trying to sign up to the site too many times. Here we have the different queries. Uh, we saw parts of this before, but like get user, get products for subcategory, which is using unstable cache and it from from here, which we'll take a look at in a second and grabbing all the different products on stable cache is basically returning on un next unstable cache up here, but uh, next unstable cache doesn't handle the duplication. So you wrap it in reacts cache and yeah, that's the, the whole project. I don't think there's really anything else here. I think, oh, here you have data.zip probably has like the millions of files of data if you want to run it yourself and that's about it. So let me know what you think. If you like the video, I'd love for you to subscribe. And since you're probably a developer, if you're watching this, give it a start on GitHub. So over here, we're up to 2,800 stars, which is really cool. And yeah, till next time.